making him cold from, you know, hardly any clothing and so on. He retreated mentally inside himself and watched what they were doing to his body as if his body was separate from his true self. And so he was able to not take all of those hurts seriously enough that he lost his own hope uh, for uh, survival. In fact, what he, he even recounts is that the ones that did lose such hope within a week, they were dead. But as long as you kept thinking that you could make it, right, that was, but that's again another stoic attitude uh, that enables you to survive. I think of, you know, the two individuals in a foxhole, the one that is absolutely convinced that our fighting here is absolutely worthless and the Germans are coming and you know they've got tanks and we're out of ammo, et cetera. All we've got is this ice cream machine that we could throw, you know, at you know no, that's sorry, that's Eddie Izzard. But Eddie Izzard? No, no one there. But you know, so you know, that person is absolutely horrified and they want to flee. There's nothing left to keep them in the foxhole. The other person, uh, same exact circumstances, but is absolutely convinced that fighting the Germans is the only way to save the free world, etc. Uh, and even though they don't have ammunition, God will provide, or or you know the, the you know the you know the other forces will arrive just in time. So I'm going to stay. If you think about it, it's exact same situations but two different mental attitudes the one keeps the individual uh, from staying and he wants to flee the other one is adamant and will keep on going uh, and become a hero basically right so if you think of it you know it's a mental attitude there by the way I would argue the same problem happens you know I know it's a horrific topic but when you think of suicide you know the person that feels like you know there's only one thing left to do, and that is to kill yourself, right? That's their, you know, whatever the reasons are behind their motivation, they're convinced that the only thing that's worth doing, it's a mental attitude, that death is preferred, rather than the other person that feels like keeping on going through thick and thin is the better choice, right? So if you think of it, that's, that's a mental attitude between the two. I remember Wittgenstein arguing that uh, committing suicide is like a rushing of one's own defenses. You know, in, a, in, a, in a sense, if you have your own defenses that keep, this is Ludwig Wittgenstein, if you keep, keep thinking about the importance of being there for your loved ones or for society or the things that you're supposed to be doing, right, Th that will help you weather whatever the hardship is that might you know, lead you to just quit, right. Um, another example, I guess you could come up with your own, I, th I think of when I went to basic training. You know, that's, that was after I had already gotten the master's degree, which was kind of silly, in a way, you know, you know, you get a master's degree, and then what do you do? You join the army. Whoa! <laughs> but remember, that was at the end of the Vietnam War, and that was when a lot of things had changed. Plus, there were a lot of people out of work and so on, uh, and it turned out really to be absolutely an excellent choice. But I still remember going to basic training, relatively old. Um, I remember the clerk asking me you know, my highest level of education, and I said a master's degree, and he looked puzzled at me, and he said, is that like an associate's degree? You know, <coughs> yeah, kind of. <laughs> but in any case, here I am with the drill sergeants trying to make me absolutely lose it, you know, trying to break me down to nothing so that they could build me back up, right, as a member of a green team. You know, and you know how they look at you and they say, recruit, you're lower than well shit at the bottom of an ocean, you know, you know, et cetera. You know, they try to destroy you, right? And if you're 
like me, at least at the time, and you're using a stoic uh, approach to things, your main job is not to laugh. You know, this, this is absolutely hilarious, you know. But don't laugh, because that will just make it worse, right? Because then the drill sergeant's going to have to pick on you even more, right? You know, so act the part, right? Play the role, right? This is all a, a stage, and all of us, the merely players with our comings and goings, etc. right? So, so here I am, yes, drill sergeant, you know, and if he says knock him out, that's what you do, you know, you get down and you do your push-ups until he's tired. Which, you know, I loved it. I thought the whole thing was absolutely beautifully done. It was one of the, the more interesting educational environments I, I remember ever being in, you know, because they were, I, I don't think the specific drill sergeants I had were the ones that developed this training program. But they were clearly good students of it. Uh, and, so, and so they used it very, very well. And you could see that they were destroying some of the folks, you know, you know, ready to go home. <coughs> Big, full adults, you know, ready to go home because they were being destroyed mentally, you know, by the kinds of things that they would say. But then, of course, if you weathered that and then you got into the program and clearly they were going to build you back up as, as a proud member of a team by, the, by graduation. You know, it was absolutely interesting. You know, so, but, yeah, I had to retreat into my mind and keep myself from acting on impulse, you know, instead use that stoic separation that enables me uh, to keep uh, happy inside my head with my awareness of just what's going on. I wasn't the one being insulted. It was an act, and I was just playing along, right? So I was safe from it. So, so are you familiar? You probably all use a stoic attitude towards things. I imagine your parents taught you to have one, right? You know, when, when your sister pulled your hair or something, you know, didn't they? Yes? Used to that kind of self-control, right? We, we, if you think of it, self-control is stoic, right? That's, that's essentially what you're doing. Is this fun? Am I boring you to death? But so, thanks to a stoic attitude, you can do your duty, focus on what's important for the state, and yet still flourish. Because you're happy, self-happy, or however you want to say it, right? Inside your, your own head. Um, by the way, that's also an um, ethical attitude that is terrific for a state especially a totalitarian state, by the way. Because uh, if you think of it, uh, the person who is in the military or in the police uh, that does what they're ordered to do without question, right? Because you know, there's no conflict. Doing what you're ordered to do is absolutely your highest duty, right? Uh, if, on the other hand, you're, say, in the United States Army and you've got you know, the commander's ordering you to go and shoot all of those villagers, you think to yourself, wait a minute, they're non-coms, right? You're not, not supposed to, sh you know, murder uh, uh, non-coms, right? You know, there are women and children, you know. Maybe if, you know, you're, you resist your officers and say, there's no way, what, what? They're, you know, how, how do we know that they're commies, you know, um, you know, et cetera? Well, they might be, right? Um, of course, in that kind of a situation, we end up having to pick someone as the scapegoat, as they did uh, Lieutenant uh, Callie, if you remember, in Vietnam. It seemed pretty clear that the orders to destroy that village had come all the way uh, from the top, but Lieutenant Callie was the one that ended up carrying the burden of guilt. remembering his name right? Do you remember the 
the situation, Lieutenant Kelly. The My Lai Massacre, right? In our, our army, he was told that his morality should have kept him from following his orders. Now, the same argument that was used by the Nazis in the Nuremberg trials, right? They're under the court you know, that we are supervising after World War II, and we're charging them with murdering uh, civilians. And their defense was, we were ordered to do it. Our ethical requirement, as Stoics, is to do our duty. That's the highest duty we can have. We, of course, in, in a sense, using the interest of the stronger, the IS, right, that Plato talks about, you know, how, what, what's justice? Well, in that case, we had won, so we imposed our particular moral system on the Nazis and said that, no, when you're ordered to kill civilians, you should tell your officers to go to hell, right? You don't do what they tell you if it's immoral. Uh, instead, you should uh, rather have them kill you instead <coughs> of you doing an immoral thing, right? Uh, well, the Nazis, of course, uh, were under uh, an ethic of the Stoic type rather than the moral code that we imposed on them. And one of the best examples of this is Eichmann, and that's where I thought Forrest was going with the, the so Eichmann, uh, Eichmann um, was the chief officer in charge of the Holocaust train movements, getting all of the, the Jews from the various towns to the camps. And he did an excellent job in making sure it was very efficient and that all the people were shipped off, uh, uh, squeezed into the cattle cars, etc. By the way, the Americans used the same system to ship Germans from Eastern Europe back to Germany after the war. So we were just as guilty, really, for doing a lot of that same kind of thing. Because a lot of people died in those trains as well, right? Um, it's clearly revenge, if you think of it, right? Um, but this book was written by a philosopher, Hannah Arendt, or Arendt. In fact, you could. Uh, uh, look, and there's a relatively recent movie um, which I just watched last summer, I think. There it is. This is the, 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 the trailer. That's a real clip of Eichhorn. Eichmann. Did I say Eichhorn? That's bad. I have a friend named Eichhorn. They were recognized Jewish leaders, and this leadership cooperated with the Nazis. They'll have our heads for this. 
Ihre Debüts gab es folgende Schlagzeile. Hannah Arendt's Bizarre Defense of Eichmann. Sie denken, deine Artikel sind großartig. Und die wünschen dir den Tod. Manche sogar auf sehr fantasievolle Weise. The greatest evil in the world is the evil committed by no ones. Did you really have no idea there would be such a furious reaction? Trying to understand is not the same as forgiveness. This one is too too bad, It is this phenomenon that I have called the banality of evil. Was he tried in Jerusalem just for the, the spectacle of it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, <coughs> they definitely wanted to get even with him. Uh, they, they caught him in Argentina. The, the Israeli uh, uh, secret service caught him there and brought him secretly to Jerusalem and then put him on trial. Hannah Arendt was actually German and a Jew, and by the way, she was also a student of Heidegger, and in fact, more than that, she was a lover of Heidegger. Uh, but by the way, she actually um, married a guy named Blucher, who was a professor, uh, and they taught at Bard, Bard College, which, by the way, if you um, grade, so if you look at her her grade, you can see her married name was Hannah Aaron Blucher, right, and knowing your familiarity with a particular movie. Um, Frau Blucher. So this is um. the movie you mentioned. Igor. This is just my personal opinion that, <laughs> that they're making fun of Frau Blucher in this movie. Remember, Mel Brooks was Jewish. <laughs> so I think the Jewish community was pretty darn upset with her reportage on the trial where she basically determined that Eichmann was just a normal, everyday bureaucrat doing his job, which just happened to be killing millions of Jews. In other words, the banality of evil is that everyday normal people are the ones that are responsible for an awful lot of evil because they don't think to themselves, gee, what am I doing? Is this good or bad? They're just doing their job. And it's all perspective to you, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. So, so, I mean, so there's dangers in being a Stoic also, right? Uh, if you think of it that way. Um, by the way, Mel Brooks argued that he did not make, he was not making fun of uh, Frau Blucher mm -hmm. with this. Mm -hmm. It just seems, ah, I think he's just saying that. Um, so that's fun.
So, next one over. Any questions? Are you guys having fun? Is this good? Good stuff? I realize I'm covering a lot of philosophers all at once here. But, the next one over is Plotinus. Somewhere in here we might want to also put the skeptics, but where do you, where do you put the skeptics? That's another choice. The skeptic is one who basically doesn't want to get involved in these philosophical arguments. You might say that, well, you can't know the answer anyway, so I'm not going to take sides. So a typical skeptic might be one who just goes about living a normal everyday life without getting involved, basically. But Plotinus gives us the one that really becomes the most popular uh, throughout Europe, the Neoplatonists. As we see when we move into the Christian era, they are initially Platonists. And Neoplatonists just, of course, means new uh, Platonists. Um, and Plotinus uh, adds to Plato's philosophy a very specific little addition, uh, if you will. Um, you remember Plato argues that you basically have two different causes of everything that we experience. The one is matter, and the other is the idos, or the ideas, or the forms. So ideas. And he does use the metaphor of the sun and the demiurge, right? It's, it's sort of the divine urge, right? To uh, spread the good. Because for, for Plato, the good is what essentially causes the universe to exist, right? So it's very close to our concept of the divine, uh, the good, uh, you know, as God, essentially. Um, and if you make that connection between God being good and not evil, as actually some uh, can ar argue, if you think of uh, um, uh, the uh, blind poet uh, in his work, uh, Paradise Lost, right? John Milton, um, the, uh, you know, the argument he has there is that the God that the Catholic Church has been holding up as the ideal all along is actually Satan. And Satan is the one that has actually thrown the real God into hell, right? You know, so, so basically you end up wanting to rescue God you know, from hell where Satan has kept God. Uh, and by the way, that also makes the church which uh, keeps God in hell basically uh, uh, the evil ones, right? Uh, and by the way, John Milton was on the side of the Puritans in the Civil War in uh, England, right? So the Papists were absolutely the evil ones. And actually, they really were, you know, in, in political you know, ways, right? Um, by the way, if you're fans of the movie uh, associated with uh, his Dark Materials. Anybody familiar with that? The first movie and the only one they've made so far, as far as I know, was The Golden Compass. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a new series coming out. I, I think it's, you have to see it on it's Netflix. Already, it's, already out. it's already out. Okay. It's Dark Materials. Oh, so I haven't seen any of the new version. Um, I read the books. I was told by a friend who teaches literature in the school system uh, and went to the uh, uh, Middlebury College, et cetera. Um, so she's you know, wonderful, et cetera. And she told me uh, that the Harry Potter books were horrible, not very good literature, et cetera. And Harold Bloom said the same thing as a critic. And you know, I read them all five or six times, and I was convinced they were OK. You know, the Harry Potter books, you know, Harry. Ron, Hermione, yes? 
Uh, but you know, if you, you've never heard of them, uh, well, there was a series of books, and they made movies from them, uh, etc. What's your uh, favorite spell? When Gardrium Levios. I was going to just say, I have a wand, That's but it's not, not with me. I have it at home. I made it from my own wand tree out back. It's a quaking aspen. Chased away, you know, the little stick creatures that were guarding it. And made a wand. Um, either way. But Pullman, Philip Pullman, wrote a series of books called His Dark Materials. And my friend said, read that series of books. That's good literature. So I did. Of course, I, I do my homework. So I went and I read that series of books, and I was disappointed. I didn't think it was very much development. You know, the individual's characters weren't developed very well, and so on. And then I came to realize that it's actually John Milton's Paradise Lost. In fact, if you wondered why the first movie was made and then they never made another one, and in fact, it didn't show around town. I think it came out like one day and the next day they closed it down and it just totally disappeared. The reason is it's anti-Christian. You know, the witches are the good side, you know, and the church is the evil side. Yes? Mm -hmm. It's not my fault. That's just true. You could do this too. Um, In the new series, they, the church is very similar to like the Vatican and holding all the knowledge and the full movie is on the web. Didn't they also use demons? Demons, demons are everybody's own spirit animal. This isn't the movie. This isn't the trailer. This is the bear fight. They have armored bears. Pardon? The animation's a lot better than the other. The, the new version is much better. It, like I'm saying, animation is obviously as well, but it's a decent series. Where am I? Huh? Is it I have excellent version of it. Okay. Whatever. Why did I bring that up? Everything's connected. Okay. So, good basically is God, and God is responsible for the structure of the universe. I don't see that as changing drastically, even from Plotinus' day, uh, or Plato's even, uh, when we think of... Um, Stephen Hawking talking about the universe and the Big Bang. Uh, clearly, we think of the organization of the universe as good. Because, well, us, right? And we think of it as anthropocentric. You know, when we look at the universe, we discover that the smallest thing and the largest thing, the universe, when you look right in the middle, it's about as tall as a normal human being. So we're just in the center of the entire universe. And by the way, this universe is obviously designed perfectly for the Earth to have arrived and be, it might have taken billions of years for it, but guess what? Who cares how long it took? We're here, and this is why the universe is here for us, you know, who are not only self-aware, but we're the self-awareness of the universe. And what are we especially concerned about? What structures our universe and us and makes everything so absolutely wonderful? Sure, you've, you have things blowing up and you have coronaviruses, even if you don't drink the beer, you still can get the virus, right? You know, so I mean, a couple of weeks we're gonna be Sorry that I even joked about that. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, corona, those are beers, right? Yeah. Frankly, 
Dos Equis, I love you so much. Sorry, that's an old <laughs> Super Bowl commercial. Dos Equis. Oops. No, that wasn't funny. Okay. <laughs> did I record that? Oh, I did. Oh, well. <laughs> Sorry, concentrate, let's, let's focus. Neoplatonists, so God is good. How does God structure the universe so that everything is good, by the way? He uses the golden ratio. So I have a first quiz question for tonight. What do you think of the golden ratio? Hi. Got a small favor to ask of you. Please Sorry about add that. your name to say you support our campaign. But Imagine if there was a perfect number, a single number so flawless it formed the basis for all art and music.